Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, Time of the Writer dinner conversation. I'm very much looking forward to it. This one is Beyond Words, Solidarity in Action. Uh, I'm your host, Marianne Tam, and I'd like to welcome our guests uh, this evening. We have Muff Anderson. Hi, Muff. You're in Joburg, I take it? You're I there? am. Yes, Great. I'm here. You. Uh, Oscar, you're in uh, Brussels at the moment in your granddaughter's bedroom. Welcome, Oscar. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. and we, thank you. And we have Ronnie Casuals um, at a location, let's say that. Um, we, <laughs> <He's so bad laughs> <for career. laughs> the trio have authored uh, this fantastic book, which I've managed to read in between all the affidavits and other things I have to read. read. Uh, International Brigade Against Apartheid, The Secrets of a People's War, that liberated South Africa. And I would really highly recommend that, that you get this because there's much in here, but even those of us who kind of think we know a lot about South African history and have read a lot, um, have not read before. And, it, and it's, it's a fantastic book. Jakana has published it and I'm sure it's available. Um, people across over five continents, uh, not even South Africans, uh, risked their lives, really. They didn't sit behind keyboards. They, they actually risked their lives for the, for the liberation of South Africa. Uh, at this point, I just want to interject to say it's, it's, uh, it would be apt to later on this evening contextualize this discussion later on in light of the uh, developments uh, between Ukraine and Russia, and we're very happy to do that. Um, uh, but we'd first like to focus, I would like to focus very much on this book, its meaning, um, and I don't want, uh, you know, what's happening in Europe to uh, overshadow this fantastic discussion and what it means to, to show solidarity. Um, Ronnie, can I just begin with you, because I think what I'd like to do with, with uh, perhaps some of the younger viewers you might not know, is to just set the scene for us in the 1960s. So we'll start there with the Cold War, and, and, and what this means and what, how this plays out, not only across Africa, but also in South Africa, uh, the ANC and the SACP and uh, the ANC and MK in exile and where it seeks to find solidarity. I think that would be an important beginning uh, so that younger people can see, you know, what was going on, what were the currents at the time. Thanks very much, Marianne. Uh, obviously, one's going to have to compress that to a tremendous oh, yeah, degree. One does, one does, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> Rather than a, a full hour's lecture to I know. people on, on that. <laughs> but just to quickly say that the struggle against colonialism in South Africa and then against the apartheid version, which was much more extreme from 1948 on, um, had been nonviolent militant over the decades from the time the ANC in 1912, Communist Party uh, 1921 had come into being. Um, and as the decades rolled on, that militancy increased to a tremendous degree. Through the 50s, there was very active defiance led by Mandela and Susulu and Tambo and uh, communist leaders as well, um, culminating in the Sharpeville massacre of 21st March, 1960. And that was the uh, turning point in terms of methods of struggle because um, after a great deal of soul searching, people don't go into armed struggle it, it, as an adventure, certainly not people as mature as the leadership in South Africa had been. Um, but it was an approach which, which, which expressed itself in the need to now turn to revolutionary violence, not terrorism, uh, the development of a sabotage campaign, force of arms, because there was no other peaceful way left open with the bannings, restrictions, outlawing of the liberation organizations, et cetera, there was no other way. And it's not just South Africa. Um, you say the Cold War, but Marion, post-1945, Second World War, there was this tremendous upsurge in the colonies for independence all over the world. And that was very militant in various countries 
the, it was put down so stringently that, uh, for instance, in Africa, from Algeria to Kenya to Guinea-Bissau, and then our neighbors, Angola, Mozambique, Namibia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa, almost at the same time, we moved towards the confrontation of having to choose the path of armed struggle. None of these organizations, to some degree, the Algerians, went in for bomb blasts in restaurants and clubs where, where whites were. It was focused on a enemy that was a system, not, not just the people. Um, well, it led to- here, the, 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 In terms of support, um, I think that's also very interesting in terms yes. of uh, the West's uh, attitude uh, yeah. to, to the liberation movements across Africa and, and um, uh, the attitude to, from the USSR, which we have to define at the very beginning here is very different from Russia today. The USSR uh, is something uh, entirely uh, different. Uh, absolutely. But that link so, is so coming yeah. into that particular point, uh, it meets then with the Cold War situation post the Second World War. Um, and whatever the motive, some people say the, the Soviets and the Chinese and the Cubans were just interested in their own, own nat national interests and wanted to influence the third world to, to, to be their allies. But it's more than that, and we are not going to go into it. They genuinely, all those countries and the socialist camp in, in, in Toto provided the material support, whilst the Western countries in all the, the, the anti-colonial struggles are referred to, the French, the Portuguese, um, and, and the British, they supported the settler countries of the world, and they defended them with an impunity, and they called us all terrorists. So it was a period of the breakdown of colonial rule. It developed into solidarity in those countries that supported the racist colonial setup, uh, Europe and the Americas. Um, it, it saw there an anti-apartheid, anti-colonial solidarity that developed, which was outstanding in terms of opposing their governments, protesting against their governments for supporting the racism, the colonialism, etc., and supported the liberation movements. Out of that was born a public anti-apartheid uh, movement across the world, isolating South Africa, other organizations, Magic of Mozambique and Guinea-Bissau, Angola, supporting the people fighting against Portuguese colonialism. Oscar yeah. Marlin comes in at that st stage exactly as a Belgium anti-fascist who comes to Mozambique, as many right. did, to serve Frelimo and so on. Right. Um, so, Dolly, I think that's a wonderful uh, um, uh, uh, foundation for us to take this. I'm, I'm sure going to quickly, I'm going to move quickly to Oscar because uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was the concept of solidarity, which you mentioned uh, a while ago. And it's something you talk about in the book itself. You know, I've, I've, I've found something really interesting in people I've met who grew up in former communist countries, including Angela Merkel and, and uh, the, my editor who grew up in Yugoslavia. I've noticed with them all that they have a different internal architecture in relation to other human beings. Just Merkel's ability to speak Russian, Merkel's um, decision to take in refugees at that point. There's an interesting uh, psychological makeup, I find, in people who grew up in communist countries, a kind of solidarity in, in a way that's interesting. But you define solidarity here, uh, uh, um, Ronnie, I think this is yours, but then I want to go to, to Oscar about this, as serving the, the yearnings of humankind um, uh, for, for a better life is the core of solidarity, is what you say, the spirit of Ubuntu, where we see ourselves in others and uh, identify with struggles and will do what we need to do in order to, to assist any kind of oppression or, or repression. Oscar um, and Muff also, I'm interested in where people develop their consciousness one way or another you know what what makes someone become a right-wing fascist uh, and 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 what makes someone understand that all wars and that solid and all oppression uh deserve solidarity in some way but oscar you you had something we had a discussion earlier about fascists also show solidarity but would, would you like to pick up on that a little bit and then we're going to go through some of the people um and characters in this book and how you put it together and muff you're going to tell us your 
outrageous story, <laughs> Operation yeah. Lighty. Uh, Oscar? Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, the working together with Ronnie and Muff on the book allowed me to reflect basically on how I got there myself. And perhaps that um, can help. I mean, it's um, my piece is called Stumbling Towards International Solidarity. I mean, I wasn't born like this. And I think different countries and living in different countries perhaps give you different experiences. And I think in that process, I, I looked at three different things or three different phases. One is awareness, three is empathy, and the third one is forms of engagement. How do you act upon that sort of thing? Um, I mean, when I think back about my youth and the educational system uh, in which I was brought up in, it gives us a form of identity. And, and the identity that I got was of uh, a nationalist Belgian, right? Um, basically, I remember my primary school with uh, um, uh, maps of the Congo on the wall showing all the resources, but with li little reference on to what we were doing there, right? So you get a certain, you get taught not just skills, but you get taught a certain identity. You become you become something, you know, and that was a very nationalist reaction to me. Now, breaking out of that is, is not an easy thing to do and changing that because the media around us and the schooling around us do not want us to do that, right? So I had certain counter influences that allowed me to look at the world a little bit different. My grandfather was one. Some exceptional teachers were some. Were, were one of them. And then traveling and seeing the plight of others was one, well, because I had the luck to actually move out of Belgium and go to a different country, which was Great Britain. And during the Thatcher period at the time, looking at the trade unions. So um, it's, 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 it, it, it gave me a different way of thinking about the world, right? And it gave me a different identity. Um, um, but which was not an easy thing to do because one feels safe with an identity, one, the identity that one has got, right? And breaking out of that is quite, it's quite the process. Um, it's like thinking about, you know, acceptance or non-acceptance of inequality in the world. Um, I don't know if you know the piece by Carmen and Cervoni, um, uh, how in the in Inquisitive Mind, published, I think it's 2019, uh, uh, how people come to accept inequality as, you know, just a form of existence. You know, it's quite normal, you know, it, it, to accept that, you know, um, there are very rich people and therefore, and they're very poor people and they, all de and, and they all deserve what they've got. You know, that's a very wide sort of acceptance. And to break that, we need to become aware. So I think that's, that's, a, that's a real challenge. How can we make people, and particularly the youth, and also in South Africa, make them more inquisitive, looking at the background, because that is fading, looking at the history, but also looking forward. I think the next phase is empathy, because we can uh, start, you know, understand that, uh, you know, people live in a different way, but we, one has to step outside oneself almost. You can't step in other people's shoes, but you can just imagine how in a particular situation conditions might feel to people, right? Um, and I was very much strengthened in this by working in the working class areas of Liverpool at the time. And, you know, when I was, you know, in, the, in my twenties, but also particularly in Mozambique, because as, um, as Ronnie, I went to Mozambique to assist with Ferlimo, but my experience of a Mozambican uh, middle class in relation to poor artisans and poor producers was quite something else. At, 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 I became aware of that these middle classes don't necessarily are not necessarily interested in how these people lived. And that's threw up a sort of inner resistance on a class basis, you know. Um, um, 
And I questioned myself why I was in Mozambique to assist Frelimo when they were treating people in that particular way, right? That, that process was very slow and it took some time, but I think I got there. So when I was asked to, to, to work for, um, to, to, to assist the ANC and MK, uh, my first question is, what are you going to do when you when you get your freedom? What is going to be the you know the, the what is going to, to be the what are going to be the economic policies after that, right? And I didn't get a full answer of that, so I was very aware that there were. And I was talking to Joe Slovo at the time, and I think that that was very important. Um, in terms of engagement, what can you do? about these inequalities. And, and, and many people engage through charity. And I, I think a lot of the NGOs that I got to know afterwards and I worked for, charity and the channeling of money is one way, but really it's based on keeping the power relations as they are, right? So um, in a way, one got to go to forms of engagement that changes the power relations. In, in society, right? And in the end, that's why I, I started, I, I, I agreed with Joe Slovo and as, that's why I started to work for, for MK. Okay, let's stop well, you there. That's my story, yeah. Okay, that's, that's incredible because I think what people who read the book will know or will not know or would have known yeah. is just how much uh, you, uh, you risked along with Muff as well. Muff, if you can come in here now, um, I'm going to talk about the, the, you know, the, the, the profiles in the book shortly after this, because I think by this time, you know, our, our viewers would, would have a sense of, of what we're talking about. But Muff, um, the amount of arms that were brought into South Africa by people um, working with MK is quite astounding. I mean, Ronnie seems to have recruited almost everyone he bumped into <laughs> in different places, and they're all in this book. They all mentioned Ronnie. But Mark, please uh, give us a little bit about, you know, you're, you're a South African. Um, uh, both of you are white, which also in the book uh, is, is an advantage in, in this particular instance as well, considering the circumstances that you are going to be going into and how you will be viewed in those circumstances. And Muff, you're a South African at that time. Tell us a little bit about what was it for you that moved you from, 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 from inaction to action and actually put, putting your life at risk. And tell us a bit about Operation Lighty, which I haven't okay. heard about in the book. Okay, so um, for me, getting involved in MK was just simply to do with an abhorrence of apartheid, the sheer unfairness of it, and just moving sort of slowly from uh, working in the political underground into becoming more politicized and, and moving into military action. Um, it was probably quite easy because I grew up in Botswana and there was a big difference between a non-racial environment and then coming to school in South Africa and seeing like the, the inequitable situation in South Africa and the unfairness of it. And I saw, as Oscar has pointed out, the way people live so easily, liberals live so easily with apartheid. At my school, which was St. Mary's DSG in Pretoria, I saw that schoolgirls tolerated apartheid so easily. And as I grew older, it just became absolutely intolerable. And I became really angrier and angrier about it and wished to do something. And that's really how I became involved. I became, as I say, first recruited into the ANC and then it grew from there. Your friends and family, what, what was their, I mean, what was their leaning or what was the influence in your home there? Uh, they were all political. My dad worked um, for the United Nations. My mom worked for the International Red Cross. My brother Gavin was um, a trade unionist who was banned. My other brother, Neil, had left the country for you know, refusing to go to the army and so on. So it was like quite a progressive household. Uh, and um, and I, I think I was exposed to developmental ideas in the home from very early on. Um, and 
Okay, so with Operation Lighty, let me get on to that fairly quickly. And what I'd like to say in the beginning is that why um, Ronnie as well was eager that we write in this in the book and as a collective was that there had there has been a lot of falsehood about the story. There have been people, for example, wanting to make a film about it, claiming, making false claims about the story. Um, you know, claiming family members were responsible for the operation, claiming putting Chris Harney into the story when he wasn't involved in the story. Quite recently, there's been a review of the book in Canada claiming that um, internationalists in London devised the project. So this is this for this very reason, the people involved, the the MK activists who were actually involved in the project, five of us decided to tell the story as it happened. And uh, that's why we wrote as a collective, not as one or two people, but as the collective that was actually involved. And uh, we worked under um, a commander named Cassius Marke. He was the first commander and the second commander was um, Abu Baker Ishmael, black commanders. And um, it, it started with Cassius Marke and Joe Slovo actually. And uh, the first person who actually thought of the project was Rodney Wilkinson, South African, in combination with Aziz Bahad. And the idea was uh, a safari track, a converted Bedford, that would take weapons across Africa. So, at first of all, uh, with tourists on board. So, the, um, the truck and um, started uh, in in Nairobi, but the weapons were only loaded in Zambia. So what happened was um, a tourist office was registered in London, in a place just off from Greenwich in London. Um, we recruited British people to run that office. They knew, um, what they, they knew what they were involved in. It's not that they didn't. One know. of them knew. One of them knew, not the, the other. The had no clue. The, the other one had no clue. clue. other one just thought it was a tourist operation. Okay. Um, the Ronnie's son, by the way, one of his sons manned um, one of the phones there uh, and uh, did did know something about the operation, okay. And um, the we had a committee called the London Traders on which sat um, Manny Brown, Lawrence Harris, um, Ria Saluji, myself, um, initially Rodney Wilkinson, and initially Aziz Pahad, um, Rodney and Aziz eventually left and it was, um, four of us, okay, and Manny and Lawrence took care of the drivers and the the office. We recruited then, um, Lawrence mainly recruited uh, drivers, several, about five drivers who were British, one driver who was um, Dutch, and they did the driving um through Africa and obviously the tourists who who booked knew nothing about the whole project. The truck was taken into um, for servicing in Zambia. It would it would stop the tourists were told truck needs servicing and they would potter around Cairo Road and so on by curios and um, and the truck would go in and there our team um, the people who've written the story would service the truck and then it would roll on so it would be 
uh, it would roll on towards um, Zimbabwe. And you say through the truck. What we mean is actually put weapons in in, in, in compartments. That yes, weapons, sold. weapons in compartments. Just before you carry on, I want to ask you: Can you? Can you um, is it? I'm trying to remember the total number of weapons brought in that way. I was quite astounded by. Okay, it's it's, it's, it's forty tons. Forty tons of weapons. Forty tons of weapons. Yeah, forty tons of weapons over seven years, and then we had no casualties. No one, no one was ever found. And um, and I, I want to explain that what was important for us is that we were all in our 20s and 30s. The people who worked on the project were, we were young and we were very eager and the drivers were young and the people that um, we recruited to receive the weapons were young. They were also in their 20s and 30s and they were internationalists. And um, so those drivers were internationalists. The people who we recruited to receive the weapons inside the country were internationalists. Also very young. And everyone worked with great fervor and enthusiasm. But none of them knew each other. So the drivers didn't know the people inside the country. There were cutouts at all points. You know, the drivers took the vehicle to particular places inside the country um, and then they hired vans and then people inside the country would collect the vans and take the weapons to specific places and then hide the hide the weapons, store them and then bit by bit start to distribute them over a period of time. So the stories you read, the stories you read of, of Martha and of Pierre and of James and Andrea and, um, and Peter Craig and so on, these, these are stories of real heroism. You know, those people who for years and years and years worked on their own with um, Jenny in Botswana or me and Cal and they just are real heroes. Um, and, and many and many of these people also working uh, through different geographical spaces, making this happen. Um, yes, as you you've, you've set out in the book, from Zimbabwe, from uh, Mozambique, uh, Swaziland, Zambia, yes. Palestine, GDR, Russia. In the long run, all these you know Scandinavia and the Netherlands, and the the the, the, the network and extent is is large. I just wanted yes. to ask Ronnie here at this point, Ronnie, what was it that you were looking for? I mean, you do come up as the recruiter and, 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 um, uh, and, uh, you know, a person who, who, who gets things going. What was it you looked for in people? And, and um, how did you know kind of that, that, because the conditions, if you read, you know, the, the stories of, of those people that all of you have selected together to read about. I mean, these were vicious conditions. Your, your frontline states were bombed, people were killed, people were abducted, people were murdered. The security apparatus literally had free hand, could do what they like. And, and, and you know, MK had been infiltrated. It was deadly um, to do any of this. I mean, it's easier, you know, it's difficult to think now in South Africa, we can protest and do things, but, you know, then we didn't even see a Mandela's face. Um, so, Ronnie, what what would you look for um, as someone very, you know, narrowly tied in with this uh, international brigade mm -hmm. um, in someone? Sure. So, you know, you jokingly said I seem to recruit everybody I met. Um, <laughs> well, you know, when really took time, uh, you don't pounce on people. You have to get to know them. And of course, through the struggle uh, in South Africa itself, you know, before I was in exile, and those who were before me uh, had been recruiting people as I was recruited after the Shuffle Massacre. So you needed to know the person. You had to have somebody who was absolutely trustworthy, um, somebody who would be committed to the work um, would be prepared to sacrifice themselves if necessary. 
that you could rely on, a person who's disciplined, a person who doesn't spill the beans and brag and talk and drink and then confide in others, a person with a steady nerve um, who could do underground work and be relied on. So you had to really get to know the person. And that initial recruitment would take some time after studying the person in the way I've suggested, and then not pouncing, but through discussion and politicization, getting their views, um, becoming surer, checking if you could with others who know the individual before actually feeling convinced that you could broach the subject. And you would broach the subject gradually, not say, would you be prepared to smuggle guns? You would say, well, you know, you prepared to demonstrate in the streets of Amsterdam or London or New York. Um, what do you think extra is needed? Would you be prepared to do some further work because the movement needs some very special or specific things. And if the person was interested, then you could develop that further. And only at the point where you felt you could rely on the individual, you could start talking the way Joe Slover talked to, to Oscar as an example. But this was, was the way. So whether one was underground in South Africa or working in a solidarity movement abroad or in Africa, you followed the same kind of approach of recruitment. I mean, that's, that's the most important thing, because once again, when you read this, this book, and, I, and there's so many profiles here that it's difficult to you know, pick out one, but, you know, people like Connie Brahm in, in, in the Netherlands with the anti-apartheid movement and then Operation Vula. So I think also when one reads, you know, this does read like Jean Le Car with, you know, people wearing makeup being smuggled back in, but it's real. And, it, and, and, it, and people lost their lives as a result of it. But I just wanted to ask the three of you as the as the sort of co-authors and, and editors, why now? What, what was it about now that made you feel that we needed to bring out this collection? And how difficult was it to get people who were deep underground to, to share some of those secrets? Like, I didn't know that the Dutch supplied muesli to the camps in Angola. So, you know, so there's like little small interesting things yeah. about, you know, where food supplies came from, where money came from, and the the support, the sports boycotts and everything else that led up to the moment when we had to do this negotiated settlement. But um, I think I've taken myself off the thing. Why now? Why, why now and not earlier? Okay, maybe I, I don't want to hog things. And it's so yeah. interesting listening to Muff and Oscar. Yeah. Because they like represent a younger, a younger, a yeah. younger yeah. level than me. You know, I'm from 1960. I, I, I'm a, a dollar now. But um, it did start with, um, with, uh, with me talking, actually, to Muff at a specific stage, probably about a year before we got on to writing the book. So I had been instrumental in um, the production of a previous book, which came out about 12 years ago, called The London Recruits. That was the initial people, about 60, 70, who I'd been recruiting in London in the 60s to do more simple things at that stage, come into the country as couriers, uh, bring in money, bring in false documents, um, and then carry out acts of um, propaganda or, or information, leaflet distribution and the like. Mm. And at a certain point, we put that into a book edited by Ken Keeble called The London Recruits. It's done fantastically well. The film's being made of it now. But over the years, um, I began to feel that there were so many other stories, not just London, Canada, Amsterdam, although Connie had produced some excellent uh, book from there, but France, Belgium, people like Oscar, and then the comrades, African nationals in the frontline states. And Zimbabwe and that in particular. Was, that was buzzing around in my mind. I learned so much about our relationship with Zimbabwe, or not our relationship, but MK's relationship with, with Zimbabwe and Zapu and Zanu and that uh, schism there. I think that you know people need to, in these difficult times with uh, you know such xenophobic 
Uh, exactly. Just, so, you know, we had so much support yeah. from, from the nationals in the neighboring states. And Zimbabwe, they were outstanding, but in all these countries. And there's some wonderful portraits of very modest, simple guys, motor mechanics in Maputo, Swaziland. Yes. Yes. People yeah. who have died. But, you know, the story about the panel beater in yes. Maputo, I think, is the most beautiful. I loved it. I loved it. I love that. We, we, that we've got his, his daughter who writes about him. It's, it's so stunning. But just to quickly get to Oscar and, and Muff. So I, a year before we began the book, which was during COVID, July, August, I had said to Muff, you know, Likey, the operation and so on that you guys had been involved in. And they recruited a lot of people. I, I said, I want them to speak up. And um, it was left hanging. Come to June, July of last year, I came down with COVID very heavily, but I didn't have a fever. So my mind was working. And I, I, it, it lasted about six weeks in June, July. And I thought, this is time to start linking with people and asking them to write their stories. So like, Half of the people in the book I contacted, I uh, got Muff and Oscar to do the same, and we gave them a date to write their story. Some didn't want to. Most of these people uh, are, are, are really people in the shadows. They don't seek the limelight. They're very modest people. You've got to start encouraging them and encouraging them in terms of you've got a story to tell that's so important now. Mary, we said, why now? Because what's happening in the world, we've got Ukraine now. This is pre-Ukraine when it started gestating. Um, we've got to inspire the youth to work to make it a better world and fight against oppression and discrimination and racism all over the world. So we began to get people to unwind and begin to write. Not uh, easy. So, uh, Not easy. Yes. Mm. Okay, okay, I, mean, I, I was just, sorry, I was just going to go, 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 go for it. Go saying for there's it. an interesting element here. Um, and Jakana really come in and Muff and Oscar particularly why I then got them to co-edit with me, because I was compiling it and getting it put together. And Jakana had said to me, okay, it's a great book. We're now talking about July. I started thinking by the end of October, November, I get all these stories back. Jakana said, fine, give us the manuscript at the beginning of this year and we'll bring it out by May. So Ronnie, in his COVID phase, is lying back and suddenly gets this crazy notion, my God, December 16th is MK's 60th anniversary. Let's try and bring it out then. Uh, so I asked Jakana, and they say to me, Ronnie, yes, it's doable, but we've got to have the manuscript by the 1st of September. You've got, you guys have got to virtually do the editing and even an index, and then we can do it. I yes. then to Muff and I mean, Oscar, and I say to them, can so you many help years. us do it? And we advance the deadline for all the contributors. They moan and groan, but we did it. We brought but, it uh, out, and it came out in December. Edition. <laughs> okay. I want to warn us, we've only got 20 minutes remaining, right. and I'd like to hear from Oscar and Muff um, a little bit, but I also would like us to, before we move into talking about Ukraine, to try and explain... Uh, to audiences what the emotional connection is between African countries and the former USSR. Um, you know, it, 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 what that um, means and how it plays out now in our responses uh, to what is happening uh, at the moment in Ukraine and Russia. And Ronnie, you did say you wanted to chat about it a bit, but I'd like to just chat to, to Oscar and, and Muff about how hard it was to get... Um, people who used to work in secrecy and put their lives at risk and 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 some who were tortured and others to, to talk about a time that's not easy to talk about. Oscar, maybe you can give us uh, some indication of what that was like. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, it was, I mean, as Ronnie said, people are, first of all, modest. They thought what they were doing was quite a normal response to, a, to apartheid for something, you know, from a, a system that had to be changed. So, there's not really much 
to say to the outside world that something they did, at something they thought was absolutely necessary, and let it be like that. So to, <laughs> we had to encourage them to say, look, but the outside world is forgetting what's happened, and particularly the, the youth in South Africa is, is forgetting what's happened. But, um, and and as, as, Ronnie, as, as Ronnie pointed out, um, so it took some time, and, and particularly um, people who got heavily involved didn't want to have a book of all whites happening and being involved in apartheid. They wanted the book actually uh, pointing out that internationalism was not just white. It came from the, the frontline states as well. And I think that was very important. Right? Mm. Um, really? And that it... You know, it's as Ronnie said, it's not a balanced approach, but at least we it, it encompasses a broad spectrum of people who engaged in very many different ways in that struggle. Um, so we had we had quite a number of discussions in the beginning about whom shall we include and whom shall we not include, um, not just in K, but also other forms of, of engagement. Um, and not just on one level, on, on the level of civil society, but also in the, in the United Nations and things like that. So we try to sort of at least try to cover these different aspects. Yeah. And it's great. And you've managed to succeed yeah. because it's quite astounding, the depth of support yeah. and, and yeah. what people would yeah. math. Um, um, anything on, you know, what is it? Is it people are just so accustomed to, to not talk about the past? Mm. Yeah. Um, okay. From my side, we found some people wouldn't talk. Um, some people refused to participate in the book process. One person who worked for the UN refused to participate. We had to really urge someone, for example, like Martha, who's an Anglican priest now, to go on the record. But once she did, she felt it was quite a healing process. Some people who had never, ever received counselling after all these years or even been debriefed found it extremely traumatic and cried as they wrote their stories. Um, I think even us, you know, like so-called hardened guerrillas who had recruited people found it hard to tell our stories. Um, so there is all of that and obviously like a lot of healing needed after a book like this and you realize that a lot more needs to be done and processes gone through. Some people from overseas wrote their stories, especially the Dutch ones and Belgian ones, wrote their stories four or five or six times and kept rewriting them as they weren't happy and didn't feel they had completely captured them. On the issue of Russians, I'll just say this quickly. Um, South African um, guerrillas and freedom fighters are very fond of Russians, obviously, because we were trained. I mean, I personally had a MCW trainer, who, you know, in, in the camps who was, you know, we were very fond of, and we got all our weapons and everything from the Soviet Union. All these weapons we bought in, a lot of the, those came from the Soviet Union, so we always felt we couldn't have won um the on the we couldn't have got as far as we did without the soviet union and so we were very uncritical and uh, uh, probably it was only when um joe slovo wrote has socialism failed that there started to be even a critique of socialism and um i think it, you know it was very much later when we started to realize that um, there, there was like a lot of corruption in Russia. It, it took a, a long time. I think the, the you, you know, like we're, even with the Russian invasion now, which is so blatantly wrong, and, uh, and Putin behaving in such a Rasputin-like way, it's been very difficult for a lot of South Africans to even grasp what's yes. going on so um because there's always been this this love of of russia um even even with the sort of crazy business deals that's gone on 
Um, but I mean, I, I think Ronnie would like to address that. But but I also think at the same time that there has been this problem with the whole world not dealing properly with Russia, and uh, and and turning it into a bit of a polecat Europe not dealing properly with Russia, not not embracing it, not not uh, calling it into the EU and. Um, and uh, dealing with it properly, calling it to account, you know, just letting it go on like a, a sort of uh, post Cold War, um, or just allow, allowing the Cold War to continue, really. So, yeah, that's my feeling about it. it um... Yeah, I, I mean, as we said earlier on, you know, Putin's Russia is not not the Soviet Union at all. But um, yeah. uh, Ronnie and also uh, Oscar, if you if you have something to say, we we haven't got much time left, about fifteen minutes, which could be an eternity. Uh, before uh, you answer, I just wanted to ask something. Warren Neeb, hello, Warren. Thank you for tuning in or watching. Uh, he says this work is critical for young people. How do we make this book truly accessible? Um, it's a question. I don't know who wants to answer that. Muff, why don't you, or you, you or Oscar? Well, we have discussed this. I'll just, I'll go very, very briefly. Um, um, I think it's the whole question about, you know, being inquisitive about your past. And I think, if if I think about the, uh, if I listen to what is being taught in South African schools on their history, nothing very much has changed. And I think we could really do something in terms of um, engaging the youth and in in discussing and debating different aspects of their history, as well as different aspects of what is coming, going to come in the future, like the whole question of climate change, conflict, and all that sort of thing. I think we, we can develop something like that because we have developed something in Flanders here that is used in school. So that is, and I've been involved in that. So that, 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 that is one thing we can do. Um, so I, I, I think we can, we can take that forward because if you see, also look at, Lily's Lee Farm, who is a museum, I mean, the museums are closing. People are not going there. Mm -hmm. um, um, the, the youth is not going there. And, and, that's, and that's a real pity, right? Um, and I think it's part of creating democratic practice and active citizens in South, Af in, in South Africa to do this, because I think that is really important, you know. Uh, making people think about their past and about their futures and how to engage with the present day South Africa. Hmm. I think that, that's very, important. Yeah. very important. I think uh, we often get up, uh, caught up in the chaos of palace politics everywhere and we forget yeah. that this work needs to be done yeah. on the ground. And this book for me should, should be in every school library. There's another book I'm launching this week called Spoiled Ballots, which is very funny. It, it levels the playing fields and mm. shows you that all politicians are bastards in the end, I suppose, not ideologies. But um, Ronnie, um, you mentioned that uh, we, uh, I would like to have us discuss Ukraine and Russia and South Africa's response to it and our emotional ties to the Soviet Union Union and, and how that perhaps gets in the way of us being able to make a decision right now as a country on, on what it is we should be saying and doing in relation to this war. Just the thing about the emotional ties, um, it was the Soviet Union. And whatever the faults and the weaknesses, you trained in the Soviet Union, be it in Moscow or Odessa, um, and the people who trained you were not just ethnic Russian. Uh, the most popular instructor we had in Odessa, 1964-65, was an Armenian uh, political instructor. He was just out of this world. I write about him in my book, Armed and Dangerous. And there were many people from all over the Soviet Union, but of course, Russian speaking. So when we trained in Odessa, or then others later in the Crimea, this was all regarded as absolutely part of Russia, not just you know, Ukraine. Uh, but we couldn't distinguish whether the person 
we were talking to, and sometimes the recruits in the Russian recruits or Soviet recruits, whether they were Ukrainian or Russian. Um, so it, it worked to quite a degree. And then the support that they gave us, and I can tell you, Marianne, the guys who trained us in 64, 65 had been these officers who had fought the Nazis from the gates of Leningrad, as it was called, Moscow and Stalingrad, Volkograd, right through to Berlin. And they were compassionate. They were humorous. They told us how when they crossed into Germany, they were given instructions not to harass the local people. And one of these guys said he came into a farmhouse and the German woman, the mother, was drowning her babies in the bath. They had to stop her. And she said, because she was told the Russians would come and eat them up, this kind of stuff. So of course, there's tremendous affection, but you know, we've seen the collapse of the Soviet Union. We've seen Yeltsin, Boris Yeltsin, who sold the country's assets to the West. And then we see Putin um, and he's an autocrat and he represents a kleptocracy, the oligarchs. He has condemned Lenin for creating the situation that they face with today, for allowing nations the right of self-determination uh, and secession with Finland, etc. cetera. Um, so people from my, my background, ANC Communist Party, uh, a debate is going on. And um, it's not just them of my generation, it's, it's the, the new guys. There are people like the Zuma group who have absolutely warmly um, commended Putin. My God, what's the reason they did that? It's, it's not the reason that drives others to feel solidarity with Russia. But I'm, I've been part of having discussion and their comrades who say, look, there's humanitarian factors. The others who say, don't be so liberal. This is anti-imperialism. We've got to support Russia. It's taken me a bit of time. And I've chatted with Muff and Oscar, by the way. And I, I am absolutely clear. And I believe that Lenin and true communists would say that you cannot invade. And it and absolutely is against international law and it's against humanitarian law. And I condemn the invasion. I do understand, and we need to bring it out, the role of the USA, the absolute hypocrisy of the West, what they come to do in terms of NATO, which Warsaw Pact was dissolved in 1991 with the Soviet Union. Why does NATO exist? Because it's wants to deal with Russia, they want the resources, they want to, want to Boris Yeltsin there, Putin is standing up for particular reasons of the oligarchs and using the, his propaganda, um, but we've got to see through that. And in terms of that, um, we do bear in mind that the opening shots of war, it doesn't mean that the first person who was shooting is actually the aggressor. What was, comes before? What's the history before? So yes, they wrong to have invaded and to now be bombing cities and frightening people. And, and you know, half the people who have gone to, you, to, to Poland are, are children. This is absolutely abominable. Um, but then look at what's led to it. USA and NATO have exacerbated the situation. What they're doing is hypocritical. Ask the Palestinians. Um, sanctions, we say sanctions against Israel um, for what Israel has done and bombed Gaza, you, et cetera, et cetera. How you, on earth can we condone that? But okay. yes, it yeah. must stop and Russia must be condemned. Putin, I believe, has done the Russian people the disservice because when they say Ukrainians and Russians are sisters and brothers, my goodness, they playing into the hands of imperialists and those very same Nazi neo-fascists, and they are in the Ukraine, who will get support now because people see Russia as the aggressor. Mm.
It's extremely complex. And we spoke earlier on this evening, the International Criminal Court has just issued, I think, uh, I'm not sure what one calls it. Um, but interestingly enough, the United States is not a signatory to the International Criminal Court. Exactly. So, you know, but do you think this will rearrange the way the global world order works? Because it works, because the hypocrisy is so obvious. But, you know, it has always been, you know, in, in World War II, you know, Europe is a genocidal continent. 55 million people died on that continent. That's more than are alive in South Africa today. And those ancient histories bubble along. But do you think that younger people or today, that this shows us that we need a different way of approaching conflict and a world solidarity and you know to f financial systems need to change is this a moment and, and perhaps all three of you can just end off with is this okay. a moment yes because we we should get a view from oscar and and yes. i I'd just yes, say please. in relation if yeah. only that could happen mm. if only it could happen what we see and why i remind people to look at nato and the u.s motives and moving up onto the Russian border, that the propaganda machine of the West, of imperialism, of the former colonial powers, from CNN to the BBC to even Al Jazeera, it's one way propaganda flow. They've banned the one station that gave a Russian view, even if you yeah. can say it's propaganda it's crazy, Russia today. Crazy, so, crazy. so people, the ordinary yeah. people are so um, affected by the way in which the information stream is dominated in every way. It's yeah. a huge issue and a huge problem, which is why we must call for international solidarity to save the, the people of this world against aggression of all kinds, against Libya, against hoping. Afghanistan and Iraq and that's Palestine. It. It's not just Ukraine. And that's the struggle. And even if we are a small voice in the wind and the hurricane that comes from Boris Johnson and Biden and company and Macron, we have to organize and raise our voices. We've got to get Russian people and Ukrainian people, the ordinary working people, as was the case in the yes. First World War, with, yes. you know, uh, wonderful no, people from Germany, um, the poets and the Brechts and people like that into the Second World War. Appeal to the workers of both sides to come together, the ordinary people, the common people. So that's so I think my perhaps, view on it. Perhaps they, the oligarchs they, will all come together and fell Putin. They, they're they, the fascists. <laughs> yeah, yes, these are the people who are in the danger to humankind and to the planet and the, behind the climate change and global and warming lot, through the industrialization, their greed, yeah. and so on. Muff, well, that's, uh, and that's then, what I'll say. And thanks very then, much for having me. Right. <laughs> uh, Muff and Oscar, if you have just a few parting uh, uh, sentiments about here and now and, 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 and what it is that's happening. Muff? Well, I agree with Ronnie that the world's got to look at Palestine. Um, I agree to that uh, issues like racism, inequality, poverty, gender equity, sustainable development, um, rural development, climate change, energy, environment, environmental issues and um, immigration and so on. All of these are issues that we're going to just continue with for such a long time. And these are issues that youth can really get involved in and um, be change agents in. And I think the, the real challenge now is that to, to ensure, because the right uses these issues, a lot of them, as much as the left uses them, a lot of them. And you, you have to really be sure as, as youth, that you're not getting involved with really fascistic organizations. And, um, and I, think the, the, I, I think the key is to, be ensure, is to ensure as w when becoming involved in solidarity that you're not are involved with an organization that's anti-human rights. 
So when, when taking up issues of gender equity, when taking up issues of climate change and sustainable developments and so on, ensure that it's not also an, an organization that's standing against immigrants and pro-xenophobia and so on, I would just say that. That's very, very important. Such an important observation to make because it goes exactly into internationalism and solid, human solidarity. Oscar, mm. a few words before we go, and I have really, really enjoyed this conversation with all three of you. I just want to say, because we'll suddenly be going off, and I really do recommend highly, highly, highly this book. Every library should have it. Mm. Oscar? Yes, I, I'm just wondering how oligarchs from the East and, and from the West think about this issue. Uh, because their, their interests are probably very close to one another, yeah. uh, especially since the oligarchs of Russia and are investing in, in, the, in the West and have their money stacked away in London somewhere. And, uh, and the British government is not willing to do anything about it. Or, <laughs> but, I mean, I see a, a beam of light. I mean, I've got an, an 11 year old grandson here. And um, I you know, he's asking me when I came in what I thought of, what I thought about the conflict between Russia and, and, and Ukraine. And I was asking him, uh, you know, wh why are you asking that? And actually, they're discussing the issues at school. They, and, and he's 11 years old. So the teacher brings up an issue and asks them what they think about it. And, they, you know, and, and the issues of human rights are both in East and West are being discussed. I mean, that was an interesting thing that I found out today. So here we are, um, as when, I talk, when we're talking about the youth of the future, you know, how they look at certain issues, how you form their identity. I think we've got to take away that, that sort of separation between people in the, in the East and people in the West and, and get their, you know, them to understand that we want people on a very, very small planet. Uh, uh, and it will think, and it will take some time to get there. But I think, I think that is part of the democratization process, right? Um, and it is a process. And I think we can start it both in South Africa and obviously they 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 starting it here. And I think that that is a very positive thing uh, to look at. And I agree with Ronnie. Of course, we have to look at our support for Israel and the Palestinians. You know, this is part and parcel of it, right? Very much be brought forward. I haven't heard that they're doing that now. But okay. I uh, yeah, yeah, Sorry, Do I yeah, interrupt. That's, yeah. that's how I would look at it, yes. I just wanted to end off then on a note from uh, Senamile Mabuza to everyone saying thank you all for your, humani your mm -hmm. humanitarian work. Even the release of this book is an extension of that. It serves as a reminder to get involved and to look inside ourselves for a greater cause. Thank you. So mm -hmm. I couldn't think of a better way uh, to say good night to everybody and to the three of you uh, for this book and for this evening's conversation. We could have talked for hours, but um, very valuable, very important. And um, thank you all very much. And please be safe and take care. Thank you, Maria. Thank Thanks you. very much. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.